is Disability Awareness Month, and we're gonna, we had some poster winners, I believe. Madam Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Deck, it is my great pleasure tonight to recognize the student and class first place winners of the October Disability Awareness Month poster contest for this year. This is the second year of having the poster contest in the county, and it was a huge success. All 11 elementary schools participated this year, and there were 164 poster entries turned in. Dr. Jack, Dr. Warner, Mr. Korpening, and Mrs. Halkowski and I were able to visit each of the winning schools last week to present the winners with gift cards to Chick-fil-A, as well as show them their frame poster that copies will be sent to all schools in Fauquier County um, that'll be posted in their buildings. And without further ado, we'd like to announce the first place student winner, which is fifth grade, a fifth grader at Pierce Elementary, Raina Mickley. And I'm not sure if it's Raina, Maybe if Mrs. King could come and accept. Congratulations. And then we also had a first place class winner and that was Mrs. Fitzmaurice's AAC class at Bradley Elementary, which has students from K through second grade. If you guys can come on down, that would be great. Congratulations. Congratulations to all our winners. Thank you all who entered and for sharing your beautiful posters with us. Special thanks to Brumfield Elementary special education teacher Amanda Hazelhurst, Randy Carpening, and the SEAG members for supporting and helping create this wonderful opportunity for our students. Thank you all. Okay, next up is board reports, and I'm going to start with Ms. Litter Reber. Um, I will let the finance team do the, the school finances, but we did have one notable thing of excitement in the finance committee meeting, and they are putting a book vending machine at oh, yeah. uh, Greenville, and yeah. the kids don't have to pay money for it. They earn, like, coins that yeah. they can put into it and get books as... Uh, rewards for, for good behavior. So hopefully we can get those into all the schools if this goes well as a pilot. Absolutely. That's all I have to say. Okay. Ms. Sloan. Madam Chair, no report tonight. Thank okay. Um, I'm gonna pick up a couple of things. Mr. Bland wanted me to uh, announce that Mountain Vista Governor School will host a back to school night next Tuesday at the Warrington campus from 5.55 to 7.45 p.m. And I double checked with him and he said, yes, that is correct. So 5.55 to 7.45. Um, I went over to Mary Walter one evening last week, whichever day that was, and um, as for their fall into reading and they had a I think they, the report I saw was over 200 kids. Mary Walter. Yeah, go through just excited to be out and to see each other. They're hanging out of the windows of the cars, waving and yelling at each other. But, um, and the Mary Walter teachers had done a great job of um, 
portraying some book characters as we drove through. Lots of fun. And then for building committee, um, Taylor Middle School, R the RFP is in procurement. And I can't see Mr. Graham to where he's shaking his up or down. Up, yeah, okay. <laughs> Cedar Lee Middle School, we're going to have our groundbreaking ceremony on Friday, this week, Friday at 11 o'clock at Cedar Lee. And those of you that drive through there know that some ground has already been broken, <laughs> as you'll see that huge pile of dirt. But um, that's just some preliminary stuff, but we're going to start the real stuff. That's is. Is that Mr. Bland saying something? Or that's feedback? I think it's feedback. I think he's watching that. Yeah. Okay. And then um, we talked about, we had hired Downey Scott to do an in-depth CIP evaluation. And they have started their work this yeah. week. This week, I believe. And then we also had talked about the um, Global Plasma Solution, um, the tests that were going to be done by the two laboratories, those tests have been completed, and uh, we will let you know as soon as they have their reports to us. And I think that's everything. Ms. Pauling. I had the opportunity to attend the SEAC meeting on Thursday, and um, to an observer presentation by Kathy Crane and Megan Howland. Um, and they were talking about improving our literacy efforts in K-5. And uh, it was just, it was a great opportunity to see the work that, um, that we're doing here as a county uh, to implement great things for our, for our early readers. Uh, but I, I think I wanted to make sure to highlight this resource that to our special ed parents uh, that if this is a great resource for our community and it was something that I didn't really even know about a few years ago and um, the things that I've learned every meeting there's there's some kind of information for um, for parents and for students and things that they're they're doing in our school to meet the needs of every student so wanted to make sure to highlight um, the SEAC and say follow them on Twitter if you also don't have access to it, make sure you talk to your, your child's case manager and they can put you in touch with the SEAC committee and, um, and, and get you in touch with that. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Jack? Uh, just a few things quickly. We, um, I had my last student advisory meeting today with Liberty and uh, the, the other two were last week and those are always fantastic. That's always an uplifting experience and it always makes me feel, I leave feeling as though um, we're in good hands moving forward. Um, they're, they're just phenomenal kids. Uh, also, there was a foundation meeting last week where oh, we yeah. talked mostly about fundraising and disbursement of funds. And this is a kind of a new problem recently for the foundation actually having a significant amount of funding through fundraising to uh, provide to teachers for grants, et cetera. So that's kind of a nice problem to have. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we had my, I had my ACES meeting, which was my teacher advisory meeting last week, and as I told them afterwards, that is truly how that meeting is, is supposed to work. It was a lot of very, very good uh, questions, concerns, and we were able to work together, work through a lot of those, so it was a very, very good meeting. And last but not least, we had principal's meeting today at the airport, and uh, we most, more than anything, we talked about the, the issues and problems that have been created by um, having a lack of bus drivers uh, and some solutions to, for example, having teachers having to stay after school for an hour or, or more yeah. waiting for buses. So we were able to troubleshoot a little bit, come up with some solutions uh, school by school based on how severe their problems were. Uh, but uh, so a lot of meetings, a uh, lot of problem solving and working together to come up with solutions. Great, thank you. Okay, and we move on. Our I don't think Duke had anything. Um, we'll move to the human resource report. Ms. Downs tonight. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Jack. The following is a brief summary of the occurrences in the human resources department for the month of September. Currently, <coughs> we have 46 certified vacancies. 
We have 27 classified vacancies. And upcoming on our recruitment schedule, we have Meet Fauquier County Public Schools virtual hiring event, which is um, Wednesday, October 20th from 5 to 7 p.m. And we have our Ed Week Top School Jobs virtual job fair Thursday, October 28th from 1 to 5 p.m. And hope to have more information coming soon about uh, drive a bus event so we can replicate what we had done previously. Any questions this evening? I know we had like nine initially yes. and from we have, that. And we have six still in training, I believe. Yes, so we have six that great. have gone through the process. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. You're Anybody welcome. else? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next we have financial report, uh, Ms. Peek. Good evening, members of the school board. I'm going to give you the financial report as of September 30. 2021. Um, we have are now showing the uh, report with the grant fund separately so that you can see grant funding versus operating. So when you look at it a little this time, you'll see it that way. The first page shows the grant fund. Um, here you have your funding for state and federal grants and any local grants uh, that are in that fund. Um, so just for the first report on the grant fund, um, the year to date revenues at this point in the year are approximately $1.2 million, and most of it is in local funding. Those would be your local grants, like from the PAC Foundation or mm -hmm. from other local organizations, not state or federal. Um, <coughs> in addition, the spending in that fund is about, about $3.7 million, or 23% of the budget. Um, because a lot of these grants are reimbursement basis, you will see the spending uh, happening and then the revenue coming behind it. So at this point of the year, we do have some reimbursements that we still need to get on some of those grants. Um, the next fund would be the operating fund. Uh, this will be uh, where most of the funding that is from the county transfer or other operating monies are housed. Um, in this fund year to date, we have 32.9 million in reven revenue, about 22.6% uh, of the budget as compared with revenues of 32.9 million at this time last year, which is consistent. Um, Year-to-date expenditures total approximately $35.9 million, or 24.7% of the budget. Um, comparing to uh, prior year this time, 15% of the budget had been expended, and uh, that is consistent with uh, salary uh, increases and changes for this fiscal year. In the asset replacement fund, we have so far to date $13,000 in revenue, and then year-to-date <coughs> we have about $706,000 spent at this time was compared to 2.1 million last year at this time. And one of the big reasons for that is last year at this time, we had purchased the school buses under the lease program. We haven't done that at this point in the year. So that's a big part of the difference. And then uh, in addition, there's been a little bit more district-wide spending um, that occurred at this point last year than it has this year. Um, On to the textbook fund, we have about 112 thousand um, dollars in revenue um, which is comparable with the amount of state revenue we had at this time last year um, in addition last year we had as transfers into the fund just for a state match portion that hasn't happened yet this year then last but not least we have the nutrition fund total revenue to date is two hundred four thousand dollars or about three percent of the adopted budget and then year-to-date expenditures are approximately 1.5 million or 24 percent of the budget we are about 25% of the school year. Most of the funds expenditures are tracking at or a little bit below 25%. So we're in good shape so far. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the report. Anybody? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Next we go to consent agenda. <coughs> I make a motion that the school board approve the following. Religious exemption 101220021.1, the gifted education advisory council membership, special education advisory council membership, revisions to personnel policies as proposed at the September school board meeting, path grant, request to rec uh, reclassify the fresh volunteer and club coordinator position to fresh special projects and events coordinator request to reclassify the activities coordinator supplement to a lead athletic director, 
school bus staff incentives as proposed, minutes from the September 13th, 2021 school board meeting, minutes from the September 27th, 2021 school board session, monthly bills and payrolls, and personnel recommendations which include new and newly hired, one superintendent of administration, five teachers, one area building manager, one office associate, one safety and security officer, one support analyst, two instructional assistants, 10 food service associates, one bus driver, and two custodians. The retirement of one teacher, one office associate, and one instructional assistant. The resignation of two teachers, two food service associates, one bus driver, one bus aide, two custodians, and one school health nurse, and the release of one teacher and one food service associate. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second that the school board approve the religious exemption 10122021.1 gifted education advisory council membership, special education advisory council membership, the revisions to personnel policies as proposed at the September school board meeting, past grant, request to reclassify the fresh volunteer and club coordinator position to fresh special projects and event coordinator, request to reclassify the activities coordinator to supplement to a lead athletic director, school bus staff incentives as proposed, minutes from the September 13th, 2021 school board meeting, minutes from the September 27th, 2021 school board work session, the monthly bills and payroll, and the personnel recommendations, which include the new and newly hired of one superintendent of administration, five teachers, one area building manager, one office associate, one safety and security officer, one support analyst, two instructional assistants, 10 food service associates, one bus driver, and two custodians, the retirement of one teacher, one office associate, and one instructional assistant, the resignation of two teachers, two food service associates, one bus driver, one bus aide, two custodians and one school health nurse and the release of one teacher and one food service associate. Any discussion? <coughs> if none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no and the motion carries and we move to, uh, do you have any? I, I do uh, would like to introduce our new assistant superintendent for administration. He is a stranger to no one, David Graham. So David is moving from uh, executive director for administration to assistant superintendent for administration. And as the board is probably aware, uh, we've had a vacancy in the assistant superintendent position, uh, I guess for about the last year and a half or so. Uh, so this is, uh, if the net result of this is filling that position with um, a guy that's been with the school division, I guess for 28 years, started as a teacher, coach, assistant principal, principal, director, and now assistant superintendent. And I like to say that Dave Graham is the one that does everything that no one else wants or likes to do. <laughs> and he does an outstanding job with it. That's transportation, food service, maintenance, school safety. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a few other things, but just does an outstanding job. So we're very fortunate to have Dave and uh, congratulations. Yes, Mr. Graham, would you like to come up and say a few words? <laughs> you got to come to the microphone. Thirty-two. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we move to information items, and first up is the annual achievement report, and I believe Dr. Warner is going to present that. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Jack, members of the board. Um, I bring to you um, the annual achievement report that's uh, required by the standards of quality and tonight. Uh, we'll just be going through the annual report itself, um, which is required by the SOQs. I'll talk a little bit about the standards of quality, the uh, school quality profile, uh, 
uh, the on-time graduation rate, and a couple of other key uh, academic indicators. So just a reminder, <coughs> and this is information coming out from the state, school accreditation is waived for all schools. The Commonwealth's SOL testing in 2019-2020 uh, was canceled, as many of us should already be aware, which means that the 2021 SOL tests were the first state assessments that were administered in two years. While the Department of uh, has reported that uh, the results of the 2021 SOL tests, um, accreditation ratings in the 21-22 school year will not be calculated, all schools will have the rating of accreditation waived. As expected, the results of Virginia's 2021 standards of learning tests taken by um, students reflect the extraordinary circumstances faced by students and schools last year and were anticipated by school divisions in the Virginia Department of Education. These scores will become a baseline for recovery during, um, from the pandemic. And this is straight from the state superintendent. I think it captures its best. Um, Virginia's 2021-21 SOL scores tell us what we already knew. Um, students need to be in the classroom without disruption to learn effectively. Um, that's Dr. James Lane. And we do anticipate that given the disruption of the last couple of years, um, while we believe wholeheartedly that we're gonna have a really good year, um, I would expect that it will take us a couple of years right. for us to be moving back closer to where we hope to be. Uh, the next slide just um, shows our community and parents um, a little bit about what the school quality profile is. It provides the link. Um, anyone can go to this link. It'll take you to the Fauquier County Public Schools school quality profile. You'll see all of our data there, attendance, SOL, um, on-time graduation, all of it's there, but you can also click on any one individual school um, for your particular school community and you can find this information. Um, these are our Virginia on-time graduation rates. We're really, really proud to announce this year that our, our rate is an all-time high of 96.2%. Uh, we're providing you some trend data here um, going all the way back to 2008, but we're really excited. Uh, we've had, in the last four years, we've had um, three of our best years. Um, our schools, our principals, our teachers continue to do all the things that they need to do to stay connected to our students in our schools. So we're really excited about that. Just drilling a little bit deeper into our subgroups, it's important for everybody to understand that we are accountable to our subgroups under ESSA, so we have to be looking at specific groups of students um, in comparison to the majority. Uh, we're really excited again this year that our African American on time graduation rate is 94.8%. Our Hispanic rate was 91.7, students with disabilities 93.7, economically disadvantaged 92.5, and really uh, we've made tremendous gains this year with our English language learners at 84.4%, noting that it was 67 the year before. Right. Really excited about that. So this is just a different look, um, again, and just trying to close one of the gaps um, at the very bottom. Um, the line in white is the 2021 school year. I put our white students there. That rate was 97.1% this year, which is also one of our highest. Uh, but just wanted to show some comparison data relative to the majority. Um, we continue to lean in heavily K-12. Um, and while you might see in any given year um, gaps and, and struggles, I think when you look at the totality of our students' experience for 13 years, it's, it's really nice to see um, that when we get to the end result, we're really looking really good in terms of closing that gap relative to our majority. Um, just adding a, a, another data point for you all this year is probably something we don't talk enough about. Um, this is our, our dropout rate trend data. Um, the last two years relative to the state, 1.94%. Um, um, last year it was 1.42%. Um, and so historically, uh, we've been making some tremendous gains in terms of just keeping our kids in school. Um, the emphasis on relationships, I think the services that we're providing our students is really making a profound difference. In particular in a pandemic where, you know, it would be real easy for our schools to lose track of kids. We've doubled down in our principals and teachers and, and folks are doing an outstanding job of just making sure that school is what we need them to be for our children. Uh, next slide is our SAT data. Um, as you'll see for the 2021-2021 school year, um, our combined rate was 1124. And if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see the, our division rate, you'll see the state, and then the global, which takes into consideration um, from all over the globe. And then the next data point um, is our advanced placement participation. Um, 
we were down to 825 tests given this year. As we know, we made those tests optional again for students. Uh, we are requiring those um, AP exams for AP classes this year, so we do expect participation will, will go back up. And then on the next slide, our uh, percentage of kids who scored a three or better three is um, considered the benchmark uh, for students to be passing uh, the AP exam. We're at 49 percent. So. Trending data will show that regardless of the levels of participation, we still um, continue to have students do exceptionally well in terms of getting threes or better on their AP exam. So those are the key data points um, that we share with you all through our achievement report um, as we've done historically the last few years. Um, at the summit this year, we'll bring you some specific um, data relative to reading and math um, at certain grade levels uh, so that you can see divisionally how our students are doing there as well. So any questions? Can, can you review just very briefly the change in state assessments this year and why we were testing in the fall? We had some parents asking that question. Is why, why were we taking the growth assessment this year in September when we've never done that before? Right. So, so one of the changes that's occurred at the state level is that um, because we have utilized last year's SOL results as uh, sort of benchmarks just to try to gauge where kids are, um, the state um, decided to implement an additional assessment program this year. Um, so that we can, at the beginning of the year, try to have a full understanding of where our kids are coming into our schools. Uh, we'll do some assessment data uh, for them in the middle of the year, and we'll do some assessment of them at the end of the year. One of the challenges that our teachers are facing is that they're coming in, right, and having to sort of really gauge where our kids are on a social and emotional level. And then we're also trying to assess where they are academically. And so they spend really um, an inordinate amount of time at the beginning of the year, just trying to figure out where our kids are. So uh, the MAP assessment, um, the, um, some other assessments that we're doing, we'll be bringing that data to you mid-year. That's really largely the reason. Uh, it's a growth year. It's trying to figure out where they are, where they aren't. And then we can begin to sort of um, personalize that instruction to figure out, you know, how do we, we get them into school. So do we know if those tests will be implemented next year as well? Or is that a, a, a this year because of what, what was happening with COVID? I can say comfortably it's this year. Um, I do think the state's getting back to business at the end of the year with its SOL assessment program. Um, we anticipate that the growth assessment piece will, will maintain um, for a couple of years, but I can say with 100% certainty for this year, it's there. So we'll know more in the spring. Yeah, I think the way it was written <clears throat> can still be changed, but the way that the change was written from legislation is that this year, beginning of year, end of year. Yep. Of course, we do more assessments Correct. in fall here, Correct. but the state level for the next year will be fall, middle, and end of year. Correct. But whether they'll do that again, I think they're going to assess during this legislative session because right. it is it is costly that would make and it's to a add lot. to right. it. It's a lot. And it's a lot of it's testing time to finish. It's time and I also understand we won't have accountability or participation for the fall because of the quarantines. A lot of the uh, school superintendents, I think, got together and spoke to, to Dr. Lane and others about there, there were students that because of quarantining or because of being in and out weren't able to take the fall assessment. Correct. <laughs> so I don't know if that was affecting us too, but we won't, we won't be dinged for not having participation. Correct. Yeah. That is correct. Thank you. Okay. Any other okay. questions? Anybody? Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Next, uh, Ms. Sandlin will share information related to enrollment report for September 30th. Good evening, uh, Chair, um, Chair um, Grove. Uh, Dr. Jack and board members and community. Um, so this is this is exciting news. We um, when we started budgeting, we were at 10,100 yep. students. Um, so our new enrollment now is 10,822 um, children, which is which is wonderful. Um, it stands um, we've increased by 573 students over last year, and so um, so we've caught up. And I can say that. Probably in majority, six of our schools have actually surpassed what it was in 2020. So um, we're on the road to getting, we're not quite where we were in 2020, but we're getting closer to that. I think we're at 11-1 in 2020. So um, in looking at that, some of the, um, has also, we want to look at the capacity of our schools. And of course, with more in, in, enrollment, the capacity, we, only, we can't expand our schools, we have to have more, more bigger buildings. So, 
Um, we are at 79% overall capacity in our system, um, whereas last year we were at 75%, and in 2020 we were at 81%. So, um, so that's a good thing, too. We still haven't um, maximized all of our capacity in our schools either. Any questions? Uh, uh, remote children that are re learning remotely, do we have a number on those, how many it is? Well, virtual—I mean, virtual academy is about 112. I think was virtual, but remote. It's 100. I think it's more like a, just virtual academy. I believe is 110. Right. Okay. Um, the there's three options. There's right. virtual academy. There's the the virtual option for students who uh, are that's specifically COVID related. Right. I believe that is at 60. If I'm, I think there's uh, 30. No, there's 30 elementary, 15 middle, 15 high. The third number changes constantly because it's the quarantine number. Oh, so yeah. yeah. That, that number is fluctuating all the time based on the number of students who are quarantined. The good news is the quarantine numbers continue to go down, so there's fewer and fewer students who are receiving instruction at home as a result of being quarantined. So based on those three pieces, the actual the number of students pursuing virtual instructions is, is much lower than we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, but the lower number is enables us to provide a more rigorous, uh, more uh, uh, robust virtual program. Because we, I think we only have five or six teachers total in virtual academy. Okay. And uh, so that works out fairly well. If we had many more students than what we have now, we would be in trouble. Okay. And those, those numbers are included in that enrollment number. I was, well, and capacity yes. numbers. Yes, they are. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? Okay, thank you. All righty. Ms. Corpening is going to share some revisions to policies. Good evening, Madam Chair, School Board, Dr. Jett. I have some um, very minor recommendations uh, for revisions to uh, school board policies. They are um, highlighted in red. There's only three of them that actually have any change in the policy itself. The rest of them are a legal reference, and that's to Virginia Code section 22.1-23.3. So that is added to all of these, and I'll go through them really quickly. Um, school board policy 1-5.4, which is school board policy manual, that only has a legal reference added to the end. Policy 2-3.7, it's the same, only a reference added to the end as well. And that is parent involvement. Sexual abuse and harassment and harassment based on race, national origin, disability, and religion. Policy 5-1.7 has legal, I'm sorry, has legal, language added to 1.1 and legal reference added as well. Policy 6-1.1, educational philosophy. There has been some language removed from 2.11 and a legal reference added. Policy 6-1.3, instructional goals and objectives, only legal reference added. Policy 6-3.3, character education, only legal reference added. 6-5.1, school counseling programs, only legal reference added. Policy 7-1.2, equal educational opportunities and non-discrimination, only legal reference added. 7-1.3, student records, only a legal reference was added. 7-3.1, code of student conduct, language change on 8.1.16, and legal reference added. And finally, 7-4.1, extracurricular activities, fundraising by students and student organization, Language was added 3.3.1. And of course, the um, reference added as well. 
these, um, these slight changes will bring us into um, legislative um, compliance and that we ask that these uh, be approved at a future school board meeting on the consent agenda. Is that consent? Does that work? Okay. Yep. Yeah, we have read through these. It was mind numbing at times, but yeah. yes. <laughs> and anyway, I think we've worked out any questions that we may have had, so consent's good, gender. Do you have anything? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, no I, I was on mute. Sorry. No, I don't have anything. Okay. And next up, Mr. Graham is going to share some information on some recent social media challenges. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Jack. Um, there's been some interest lately in some of these TikTok challenges that have occurred, social media, and there's actually a calendar that's been developed for the year through these devious licks. Um, I've seen several variations of such. Um, we've had some instances of vandalism, but not to the extent where work orders have been written to replace things. Toilets haven't been ripped off the wall. Things haven't been destroyed, mainly the soap dispensers, take the soap out, throw it in the trash, spray it on the wall, uh -huh. toilet paper and toilets. Those kinds of activities have been going on. Um, we actually are discussing, uh, Mr. Edwards and I discussed today about possibly trying to pilot some more tamper-proof type dispensers, but we get those through our vendors of the product, mm -hmm. so we have to work with them. Um, there have been some pockets that are more isolated than others, um, and we've worked to address those. And it has caused for some inconveniences because if bathrooms are being vandalized uh, throughout a building, sometimes you need to shut some of your peripheral bathrooms down so you can bring it in to where you can monitor the others more closely, which has sometimes inconveniences those students that don't deserve to get inconvenienced, which is the bottom line is that it's an inconvenience for everybody that's involved. I know our high schools all sent out letters to everybody making them aware of what's going on and how they were going to deal with it. I mean, you're, we're going to hold you responsible financially if you destroy something that's school related and obviously discipline will be associated with it as well. Um, and so they've done a good job about that. Dr. Jack updated the um, community last week as well. And I know Tara has worked with us to try to let folks know that we're aware of what's going on and that we take it seriously. Um, but some of the things that are coming are possibly coming in the months ahead involve things that I would consider physical assault, sexual misconduct. I mean, there's some things there that, that um, I would hope that our students would, would think better and maybe by some of the, the messages we're sending out, they will. Um, I heard an incident, I guess, last week, late last week, something in Louisiana occurred. A student has actually punched a teacher and um, so that's caused quite a, uh, a ruckus. I heard some polls being taken on the radio on the way to work this morning. So. Um, you know, one of the challenges of social media um, for us that we deal with all the time. It, it brings things like this into our schools and our kids get wrapped up and involved with it. So, but if there are any questions I can answer for you about, you know, I, I do know there has been, I can't share, we can't share this, but there has been some students that were caught and there's been some discipline assigned to those where they have. Okay, but good. obviously bathrooms, we can't monitor them, but so much, you know, you have to have the right uh, teacher to be able to, to monitor, you know, the, the men's room or the ladies' room, whichever one you're having problems in. And for obvious reasons, there's no video surveillance. But some of these other things that might occur, you know, there's one that references um, dirtying up, ma making a mess of the cafeteria. If that happens, smile because you're on candy <laughs> camera. So makes it pretty easy. So certain things we, we can be able to deal with more swiftly, so swiftly and accurately, but if it's in certain areas, we, we just can't monitor it as closely as we'd like to. And I apologize to those kids that are put out because there isn't soap. I mean, what I can assure you is that we make sure that soap is available to start the day, but 10 minutes in, if a kid takes the soap and throws it in the trash, then the next kid can't wash his hands. And we're aware of that. We're doing the best we can, but it, it's just, you know, I mean, throwing the soap in the trash can, I think, is as old as time, you know, occasionally here and there, but not, not to the level that it was 
recently, but it has, I think, slowed down some. I pulled a few principles where it was going on, and, and it, it has slowed down some. So. Okay, and we did, in Dr. Jack's message, it was, um, you referenced that misdemeanor charges can be filed if we identify. Right, that it's, it's a class one misdemeanor, anything less than $1,000, so that's, that's always an option, and I, and I think more than anything, you know, I've been working with high school kids for 32 years, and what, the, what high school students and all the students really need is honesty and mm -hmm. transparency. And it, it might be a prank to them, haha, -ha, but we now have resource officers in our schools, and um, if you vandalize something, vandalism is a crime. And so we consulted with the sheriff's office about uh, what are the ramifications of something like that. And I think it's important to let students know this is this is a potential consequence. You need to be aware of this. And I'll also share uh, on the on the on the other hand, meeting with the Liberty kids today. Um, you know, there was sort of a sort of a collective eye roll from all of them when we started talking about that piece uh, in terms of uh, you know it's so stupid. I can't believe students are doing this and it's inconveniencing everyone. I said absolutely. That's the, that's the problem. So uh, the sheriff's office has always worked really well with us. And this is a, just another example of us working together. We're not out to get anyone, but we need to let, make sure kids know there are consequences associated with vandalism. We need to be aware of what those things are. Okay. Questions, anybody else? Nope. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Dr. Jack, you're going to share some information on these face masks, medical exemptions, right? Yeah, there, there is a request to uh, review the, the numbers of um, accommodations that we currently provide to students. But before I did that, I wanted to just review quickly uh, the guidelines uh, via CDC. And the question being, how does an individual request an accommodation? Well, we, we have answered that, but I wanted to read this, make sure people are aware. The process for asking for a reasonable accommodation to the masking requirement is determined by each school district. So we've done that. Reasonable accommodations depend on the specific needs of the student and can include different options such as increased dis distancing or virtual instruction as examples. Uh, right now our accommodation is, our accommodations are face shields or virtual instruction at home. Those are the two accommodations we provide. CDC guidance also provides information on accommodating students with disabilities. We've also addressed that. Each application for a reasonable accommodation will need to be evaluated by the school based on the needs of the students and the resources that are available to the school. So that brings us to the next slide. Right now, total within the school division, we have 27 students who are receiving accommodations. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, there they are, 17 elementary, two middle, and eight high school. Um, we, I can show you by school, but that, that would make be much too specific and might right. be able to identify students, we can't do that. But I can tell you, the school, uh, the school with the greatest number of uh, accommodations is three. Most of the others have one, uh, one total accommodations within their school. Next slide is, this is a graph that uh, Tara put together. That, that yellow line represents when the mask wearing was um, and the tightening of uh, the provision of accommodations was uh, announced by the school board. That's that yellow line. And uh, in this case, this is the number of COVID positive cases. The green line represents the trend, the downward trend, which is, which is relatively good news. The other good news is this whole state seems to be trending in this direction, um, which is also good news. And then there's one more slide. The quarantine totals also, they sort of reflect the same sort of trend that exists with the COVID positive students. Um, and those two things go hand in hand. And I think we determine it's about for every one positive COVID case we're talking about, and it's around approximately 12 students who end up being quarantined, give or take. Okay. And that's it, that's where we are. So I was able to talk to April again today, uh, specifically about what are accommodations that are we can consider? What are accommodations sort of nationwide that can be taken into consideration by school boards? And what she provided was, um, and these will all sound very familiar, 
uh, different types of face coverings and or face shields. So that is one of our accommodations is face shields. Uh, and again, these are, these are accommodations that school boards can, can consider. They're not accommodations that DDH recommends. DDH tells us what accommodations are. They're not recommending accommodations for us. They're leaving that up to us to choose. They just tell us what, what's available to us. Uh, so different types of face coverings. Two, environmental changes to the classroom, which in includes increased spacing between students, uh, plexiglass barriers, seating students near ventilation and or air purification equipment. And a third is virtual instruction, which is what we already do. So there's not a ton of accommodations. Um, the ones, as I mentioned, the ones that we have in place now, uh, the most prominent, of course, is the virtual instruction at home. That's not included in this list I just described. These are just students. They're basically wearing shields. Right. So that is my update. Those are sort of our, our choices. Uh, my recommendation would be at this point, we are definitely trending in the right direction. Uh, I, I would not personally change anything, but um, uh, we, we, you do have options in terms of accommodation. Okay, I have a question. Yes, um, means these numbers are so low as far as the number of kids that we're talking about with these exemptions. Would it be a possibility to do as I had seen some other counties where the school is working with the parent to find an accommodation that would work best for that particular student? Because I know it, in some cases the shield is is not working as the accommodation if you for some children if it's but I mean I'm not going to get into particulars because I don't want to I you know I don't want to talk about the case but uh, is it because we're the numbers are so low right now if we're talking one kid in the school for, mm -hmm. or an average of whatever you said the highest was three um, you know can can we at least offer an option to parents at this point and say work with us to come up with something and it seemed to have worked well in the county that that I read about uh, two things one um, yeah there are there are other options the, the, the shields don't do anything in terms of preventing students from being quarantined right it's it's only a, a, another layer of basically marginal protection it doesn't protect against being quarantined right so that's that's one thing um, the numbers of students, you know, it's, there, there are so few per school. The, the, what CDA, CDC recommends is that we do work with families and we do work with children and determine what is the best accommodation for that child. These students that are receiving accommodations, they have, they, they've had to provide a doctor's note relative to a, a medical condition. So right. I think one thing we could do is perhaps work with parents and physicians to figure out what, what are some viable accommodations for students in the event that the, the shields aren't working or the, the parents or whomever don't, they, they don't seem to work for the child, they don't, they're, they're not appropriate or whatever. Right. We have to do that anyway, but at this point we've said we've got shields or we've got virtual. That doesn't mean there's other things that might be recommended by a physician, for example. Okay, it would, go ahead. I, I think, um, you know, not trying to stir the, the hornet's nest and bring um, everything up into an uproar about masks and shields, but my concern is, um, you know, that I have been approached by several, several families that um, feel like their children are not thriving um, with the accommodation, and I just want to make sure that we're looking at every child individually for, for where they're at what they need and that we're taking into consideration um, just who they are individually. And um, I feel like we kind of took a broad brush and said, okay, this is our accommodation. We're gonna do shields. Um, and I, I don't, I don't, just honestly, I don't believe that they're working for everyone. And um, so I want to make, sh I just wanted to bring that to the floor of either this is a Virginia Department of Health recommendation or it's a school board decision, a policy, um, but to say 
well, we're doing the shield because that's what Virginia Department of Health is recommending, but when parents are going back to Virginia Department of Health, they're, they're, yeah. they're not backing yeah, we, that up. Yeah, we need to be really clear about this. VDH does not make recommendations. They'll give you a list of what accommodations are available to you, but they're not recommending them. They're yeah. saying, here's some things you can choose from. School boards, you decide. It's the same thing the CDC does. Well, we don't recommend accommodations, but if you're looking for accommodations, here are some things you can consider. So they're very careful not to make recommendations. They're, they're great about working with us and, and you know, <coughs> brainstorming and problem solving in terms of what we could do, but they're not gonna make recommendations. And I think that for me, and, and I can only own my responsibility in it, is that I believed that it was a recommendation from Virginia Department of Health, and so that's what, when parents would approach me on it, that's what I would say, that this was recommended from Virginia Department of Health, um, and you know, we never had this conversation right. publicly where we decided as a board <coughs> how we were gonna deal with these children and not deal with them, but how we were gonna accommodate them. Right. So either it's a school board policy um, or it's not. And so I feel like we're at kind of at a crossroads of we need to, to, to talk about it and see what, what, the, what our position is um, and you know, if, if it's shields, it's shields, but I feel like in, in, in relating to the community, I can't tell them anymore, oh, this was Virginia Department of, of Health recommendation because it's not. So it's either our policy or it's not. And, and my hard time with this is an accommodation indicates that it's an alternative solution. And if we're putting a shield on a kid just for the sake of putting a shield on them, if, if it's treated as if they're wearing nothing, then I don't, I have a hard time labeling that as an accommodation. Right. So the solution that you just mentioned, um, Donna, is, is a solution that seems to make sense, Susan, right? So the list that Dr. Jack just read, those are the accommodations that are suggestions. All, those suggestions should be made available to all students. And if one of those does not work, then you work with the physician and say, give us another alternative. You're the expert, please tell us a, a, another one. So each, each, what did you say, 27 total? Yeah, 27, 27 total. total students. Each of those students should have an option, in my opinion, to choose from any of the accommodations recommended by VDH that work specifically for them, right? right? And if none of those accommodations work for them, then we need something from the physician that would tell us this one would work. Well, that, there, there's two things to keep in mind. The distancing accommodation is not possible. Yeah. I mean, we, we can put it out there, but it's just not. If, we're, if our schools are filled, it's to guarantee that level of distance from student to student, it, it, it does not seem possible to me. Well, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know because in the middle school, we're talking about two kids. Mm -hmm. So, and in the other schools, we're talking about one to two kids per school. Mm -hmm. So it may be that in some of these instances, they may be able to distance in the room. Right. If that's what if that's what they choose, right, and then it may be that those kids would be okay, and I have no idea. But putting the mask on when they're in the hall, but they may just need that break. Maybe that'll help the headaches or the, the I don't know the medical the anxieties or whatever right. it may be. So that's why it seemed like it would be um, at this point since things have calmed down so much that if we could have the parents and the child and the, and the school work together to find an accommodation. Sure. I think we can do that. Okay. And have I think we gotten it's anything more on the quarantine guidelines? I know that um, somebody briefed the last time that the entire state schools yeah. all had issues with mm -hmm. the number of positives that were actually coming out of the quarantines and asking them to readdress, look at that and, and make sure that we're, what we're doing is really necessary. Has there been any kind of feedback from VDH on that? Uh, there has been, and, I, and I'll tell you what's happened. Um, since we were one of the very first school divisions <laughs> to open in this state, we were experiencing the, the fallout right away. So um, we penned a letter here to VDH that said, basically says, can you please evaluate, evaluate and give us some options because we're, we have a, a very, very low number of percentage of students who are quarantined and are testing positive. So can you please reevaluate? And I pitched this to, and I'm not, 
I hope I don't think any of them are listening, but I pitched <laughs> this to my region four chums and superintendent. No shit. And there was there wasn't a whole lot of interest in it. Because they and had now, not started the school. Right. Now <laughs> there's a lot more interest in affixing their name to it. Uh, because it, for, it, initially it was really us wrapping in it, Culpepper. So, um, but they did adjust. I mean, they adjust the quarantine period. Ten days. Ten days. Uh, and for then, the te te positive test. Right, right. And then they I mean, uh, the are accepting test. the uh, rapid test. Yeah. So they, they are incrementally making adjustments, but you know, they're doing what everyone else is doing. They're monitoring what's happening with um, number of students quarantine, number of positive tests, and making decisions you know, in concert with that, which is, um, I, I suppose that makes sense, but that's what they're doing. That's why they're, you know, they're doing these, taking these gradual steps to provide more flexibility. And we don't, we haven't heard anything about the testing possibility. We haven't heard anything about our survey for the uh, VISTA program? Yes. Okay, we've not received any feedback yet on the, uh, on the, our application, but we did go ahead and or, uh, order or purchase uh, the rapid test on our own so that we have a quantity for schools that need them. And how are we using? Well, I don't think we've used any. Yet. I mean, how I'm are not, we? I'm not even sure we received them. Okay. I think, I think they were $8 a piece yeah. to purchase the rapid test. But the VISTA program, they're free. Right. Um, <coughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, I guess I look at it sort of like when we offered to provide uh, assistance, financial assistance for the, the, the test, the testing that mm -hmm. needs to occur. Um, we didn't, we didn't get a lot of takers on that. We had some, but not a lot of people set us up on that offer. So um, they're going somewhere and, and getting the tests done, and it's it, either through their insurance or some places providing the tests for free. But instead of waiting for to hear back from Vista about the availability of those rapid tests for us, uh, I think Frank and Pam just went and pulled the trigger on ordering rapid tests. Okay, good. Now. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All righty, then Mr. Graham, you should have sat up front tonight, because you're up, oh, you, there, okay. There uh, you did oh. stay up here, I'm sorry. Um, you're gonna talk about the custodial staffing challenges. At the last meeting, we came to you with a proposal for starting pay and those custodians to reach a certain threshold. Mm -hmm. And then you asked us to take a look into compression across the board, right. um, which we have started working on. Um, I know Mrs. Sandlin had a school report that she was finishing up last week. And we met briefly on Friday and I've been working with Ms. Downs as well. So we need a little bit more time to put some things together to make sure that they fit within our budget. Okay. and address compression to the best of our abilities. We think our starting rate is probably where it needs to be. Um, may become the minimum wage anyway at some point in time. But, um, but for us to be able to work on a solution, because what happens is we've got some custodians with many, many years of experience and they pass by their head custodians right. or their assistant head custodians. So we have to kind of look case by case to make sure that that it's, it's as fair as we can possibly make it for everyone uh, and remain within our ability um, for, for budgeting right mm -hmm. now. So we are working on that. And we'll have a recommendation for you for you know, several options if need be for you all to consider at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Questions? Um, just checking the document that you provided within here with some recommendations, was this previous? That was this the last? That was the same. 20? The previous simply had, we were gonna bring everybody to a single point. So your starting pay, and it would have captured a lot of our newer custodians, but that left out almost the middle third of our custodians with nothing. Um, our head custodians had a market adjustment this year already. So they've, they've they had, a, like I said, the market adjustment brought them up a percentage already. Everybody got 5%. So we're trying to do something so that we can, we wanna make sure we can afford to do that for everybody because it's, it's, it's a, m a more expensive option by including those next right. 45 people above the um, initial, I think it's 36 that were picked up in the first round. Yeah, but this chart was the same as what we saw last month. Yes, I believe yep. it was, because we have, it, well, yes, yes it yep. is. Okay. Yes it is, yep. That's Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. And these, these positions do include um, benefits, correct? We've at least got that going for us above and beyond what like Wawa's offering. 
of the upper benefit. Benefits for custodial, custodial staff. staff. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. This is custodial. No benefits. But they, they this is they get benefits on top of the the, the pay, correct? The okay. <laughs> Dr. Warner's back there nodding his head. <laughs> I just okay. uh, because I mean we we're the, all Danelle, driving down Danelle the road. Saying, yes. Okay. <laughs> we all see the Wawa advertising signs, the Walmart oh, yeah, advertising yeah, signs. So we, we are offering some. No, I know. I, I, we're still we're still not. I know. <laughs> we're not competing with the market for a lot of things that we do. Um, and uh, I've been approached by nutrition already when I was at a school visit the other day um, because two years ago we worked hard to do something for nutrition and they kind of leapfrogged ahead of a group and then now they're, so it's, it's one of those things that as we have money we need to, to do the best we can to catch up the last group that we, we were able to work with. But, uh, but no, this doesn't match what, you know, the chicken place out in Opal, it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't match Walmart. But it's better, and we have a we have a benefit package that is very you know, attractive. retirement yeah. that you it's you're not very attractive. Get. Yeah. Yes, so it's it's it's, yeah. it's very worthwhile. So it yeah. makes us that much more attractive. And and my hopes, in all honesty, with both the drivers, that we keep those great people that we have. I mean, if we attract some more, that's great. But I don't want to lose what we got. So. Okay. All right. Any other Thank questions? You. I don't think so. I think okay. we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, we go to citizens' time. Community involvement it is an important component of a successful school division and the school board welcomes public input. There is no back and forth dialogue during citizens' time. However, ideas and concerns brought to the board this evening may be referred to the appropriate administrators for future information, research, and response when needed. Please be respectful of all speakers and limit your comments to three minutes. When I call your name, please step to the podium and state your name and your magisterial district. And if you want um, your comments to be distributed, you can send them to Ginger Farm Clerk at fcps1.org and she'll make sure that they are sent out. And first up is Arlo Nadek. My name is Arlo Nydek. I'm from the Lee District. I am a senior at Liberty High School, an active member in the community, and I am also transgender. I have been out for the entirety of my high school experience, and being trans was not an all too pleasant one. Each school system in Virginia is required to have a policy in the treatment and protection of transgender students. Fauquier County does not have one in place. As of now, Transgender students either have to use the bathroom of their assigned sex, the nurse's office, or staff bathroom. There is no accommodation for students that have to take gym, no way for students to change names in the system, sex-specific activities are a common practice, and so on. All I ask and all that my transgender peers ask is for a policy from the school board. I recently emailed the school board and got a response, which I would like to address. One comment I specifically remember is that there was fear that we would become the next Loudoun County. The only thing that happened in Loudoun was the county introduced transgender access to facilities and fully grown adults absolutely lost their minds that trans students could possibly get equal education opportunities. Another argument was that Fauquier possibly isn't ready for a change like this. That I say is a very sorry excuse to silence trans voices and to favor the people that already have the upper hand in simple things that cisgender people might not think about. In response to that, as well as some other concerns, a blind spot in restroom policies wouldn't necessarily be too much of an issue. And I see this argument a lot. Policy or not, a student who wishes to do something in a bathroom will do so already. I'd say that this is too much an, of an issue just to simply deal with it as problems come up with individuals. If there is such a concern with bullying in a bathroom setting, maybe we could focus on education with the populace instead of trans youth suffering as a consequence. I have had to suffer through the, the entirety of high school, and even though I'm about to graduate, I am forced to watch my transgender friends, even younger than me, go through the same exact things that I did. 
I plead that you take this into consideration. Thank you for your time. Okay, next up is Mike Hammond. Mike Hammond from the Scott District. Oh Lord, I have to get the glasses on. I'm getting there. <laughs> I had an English teacher when I was in seventh grade who let us eat lunch with him in class and told us stories about growing up in Egypt, introduced us to 60s rock, and who had a lively discussion with us and listened to our ideas and opinions. And that was huge for a middle school kid. My high school history teacher advised us to read the front page of the paper every day, even if we didn't read anything else, so we could keep up with current affairs. I have so many examples of teachers who touched my life in ways that never, that, uh, that forever changed it and still influenced me near, uh, at nearly 50. I expect that every person in this room can say the same. We've all had amazing teachers or school staff members who have touched our lives in ways that we will never forget. That's why I find it so hard when teachers and school staff are treated poorly. Our teachers are bullied and harassed by people who presume that they know more about what needs to be taught and how to teach it. Our teachers have decades of experience, <coughs> master's degrees, some multiple master's degrees, doctorates in education and in the subjects they teach. Yet they are accused of, uh, of indoctrinating children with CRT, or SEL or equity or whatever the flavor of the month is that is used to attack public schools and intern teachers. You cannot criticize what is being taught in school without it directly targeting those who teach it. I want to say to those detractors, when these educators say that CRT isn't being taught in schools, believe them. When teachers say that SEL is critical to students' development in school and life, believe them. When our equity programs are producing record-breaking results in graduation rates, and our school district is being recognized at a state level for implementing alternatives to traditional instructional practices. You can see tangible, positive results. Ask our reading specialists what best literacy theories and applications of those theories are, and they will tell you, and you should believe them. Teachers and staff should be and need to be a critical resource for information on what can and should be taught in schools, and they need to be listened to and believed. But too often, teachers that speak up are ridiculed or harassed for doing so. They have been bullied into submission. They have left social media. They have taken jobs outside the county. And in some cases, they have left the county altogether. At a time when our staffing is at an all-time low, it does not surprise me that even with a Herculean effort at recruitment, our county has trouble finding new staff members. This area is not so large, and the pool of talent is not so big that word has not gotten out about how teachers are treated here. Stopping teacher attrition, improving working conditions and morale, and addressing the abusive behaviors of these county's parents towards school staff has to be a priority. Stopping the teachers and staff from leaving and attracting new employees starts with this board's actions and support of those who work in the school division. You have the capacity and the tools. You have your ACES meetings. You have student advisory council. You have SEAC. Continue, please, to engage with the, with, with the schools and with the teachers, but please also continue to engage with our community. I want to make sure that you're the reason that our school system flourishes. Thank you. Jake Ritchie, Center District, I believe. Hello, my name is Jake Ritchie, uh, Center District. Um, I have two children in school here, uh, three years old and six years old. And um, we, in February, moved here from Fairfax County. We left that school system for reasons I think everybody in here might know. Um, we wanted a better environment for our kids, and I do commend you all that this is much a much better environment for them. They are much happier. Um, my daughters cried every single day in Fairfax, and it was heartbreaking. And we decided to um, pack up, move here, and start over. Um, one of the things I was hoping that would, um, that would change is these mask mandates. And I do appreciate the discussion earlier. Uh, I got to hear about the mask mandates. But um, my kids come home. Uh, well, first let me back up. My kids are extremely healthy. Uh, I, we all eat organic. I um, give them vitamin D3. I give them vitamin C. I have an elderberry concoction that I make for them, and they eat very well when they come home. My kids are rarely, if 
at all sick in the past six years, maybe once or twice. And that was very mild. My kids are extremely healthy. So when they get off the bus here and they get back to my house, their noses are running. Their masks are dirty, even though they have more masks. They are consistently sniffing. I'm laying in bed and I can hear them in their bedroom sniffing and coughing, and it's disgusting. And it, it almost makes me feel like that my efforts to keep them healthy are failing because there is a misunderstanding of the facts when it comes to kids of that age and this COVID, SARS, whatever. And I have filed religious exemptions when I first got here and they are not being met. And I'm not sure exactly why. I would love to understand that from you all, why those religious exemptions are not working for the mass mandates. Um, that's, about, that's about all I have to say, but I'm really hoping that you guys will listen to this and understand that children of my age, uh, three and six, are virtually almost immune to this coronavirus. It's very, very rare that they get it. And the cases when they do get it are very mild, with the exception of com immune compromise. So I would hope that children my age, I'm not talking about high school, but I'm talking about of my age, could possibly go to school without a mask on as a parent's choice. Thank you. Jennifer Wargo. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Jack, board members, assembled educators, parents, and students. My name is Jen Wargo. I'm from the Scott District, and I'm the parent of an Auburn Middle School student and a Kettleburn High School student. I also volunteer with the Virginia Medical Reserve Corps. Um, in looking at the crowd tonight, I don't see any teachers here or staff members that I know, but my comments are really mostly addressed to them. When I was a kid, I thought teaching was pretty cool, and it was no surprise to me to find out that teaching was considered a noble profession. As I got older, some friends of mine became teachers, and I made some teacher friends. I saw how difficult a profession teaching really is. All the teachers I knew loved their students, or their kids as they call them. However, because of long hours, low pay, lack of support, administrative headaches, and even disruptive students or parents, many left the profession. When I think about these usual stresses of teaching, magnify them by the pandemic, and add on top of that pandemic-related stresses, I am deeply grateful for what Faltaire County teachers and staff have done these past 19 months. So I want to say to the teachers and staff of Faltaire County, thank you. There are too many thank yous for the three minutes I'm allotted tonight. My kids don't ride the bus, for example, so I can't address bus drivers, but let me do say these specific thank yous. Thank you all you teachers and staff for showing up in the beginning of the pandemic when so little was known about the dangers of SARS-CoV-2. Thank you for keeping the school safe. Thank you for staying with us in Falkir County. Thank you for your professionalism. Thank you for the late nights of getting the work of teaching done, work that's been compounded with virtual and in-person learning models. Thank you for so effectively sharing your enthusiasm for your subjects, even through virtual teaching. Thank you for continuing to make difficult subjects understandable with any model. Thank you for allowing virtual students to do PE outside. Thank you for putting together shortened spring 2021 sports season when fall 2020 sports seasons had to be canceled. Thank you for many acts of kindness, like bringing quarantine students lunch at 10.30 in the morning when they were waiting for parents to pick them up. Thank you office staff who are so often harried during the school day, sometimes mistreated, but often, so, so often, patient and understanding. Thank you, all of you, for the many little things that don't seem so little anymore, the smiles, compliments, and words of encouragement. That you do these things and more under the strain of this pandemic is truly humbling. Again, I am deeply grateful. Thank you. Thank you. 
Pardon, Broad. Good evening. My name is Carden Broad. I'm from the Lee District. I'm a sophomore at Liberty High School, and I'm non-binary. Today I'm advocating for the implementation of a policy the BEOE requires all counties in Virginia to have, specifically regarding the treatment of transgender students. I was told in an email to the school board that, quote, I will reiterate that regardless of what I know about the transgender community, this isn't a concern with the transgender community. I will have to respectfully disagree since this is affecting the younger trans community directly, specifically those here in Fauquier County Public Schools. Per an email sent from the BDOE on September 14, 2021, the BDOE explicitly states that, quote, non-discrimination policies alone may be insufficient to meet the full scope of the legal mandate. I believe in the well-being for all students in the school system. That is why I'm speaking for those too scared to do so. I've reviewed the 26 pages of the model policy set out by the BDOE extensively. I have solutions if the school board is willing to speak with me and other transgender students on the issue. For example, allowing transgender students universal access to single-use staff and faculty restrooms across the county. A direct quote from the model policies is students should be allowed to use the facility that corresponds to their consistently asserted gender identity as well. This means that trans students should be allowed usage of the bathrooms that matches their identity. This does not mean a boy would walk into a girl's bathroom Rather, it means a girl would walk into a girl's bathroom. The VDOE recognizes that not all children have a gender that matches with their assigned sex at birth. A universal guideline that teachers, including stub substitutes, to call students by their preferred name could also be implemented with the policy, as well as a change to the attendance sheets that are printed for substitutes to include preferred names on there. We are the ones directly affected by the lack or presence of this policy, and I believe that the students affected should have a say. Thank you. Thank you. Jen Graham. Good evening, I'm Jen Graham. I live in the Scott District. I'm here today to speak up for my children. It's time to stop all restrictive policies on masking, quarantines, testing, and vaccination. It's time to say enough and give our children their freedoms and bodily autonomy back. It's my understanding that the CDC and VDH merely offer recommendations and guidelines. According to the guidance issued on the VDH website, it's left to local school boards and local health departments to determine what guidelines to enact. The public health order requiring masks in schools has clearly laid out exemptions which should be honored with no restrictive and unworkable caveats. I think this is where some confusion comes from. I've heard the school board members mention quarantine protocols are directed by Richmond. Is there an official health order for quarantining like the mask mandate? All I can find on their website is guidance and it's up to school boards to decide what to implement. It's no longer practical to force children to restrict their breathing for seven, eight hours a day. We don't need to be medical doctors or scientists to understand that masking children in this way is not good for their physical or mental health. It should be noted that this mask mandate is one of the most restrictive in the world, forcing children as young as two years old to wear masks. Many countries across the world have never mandated masks for children this young. My home country of England has never required masks for elementary age school children. What does this say about us as a society and community that we're willing to accept this? Only 16 states across the US currently have mask mandates in schools. My daughter was surprised to learn recently that there are millions of children across the US and across Europe which are, who are attending schools as normal with few of these restrictions. Her response was to ask, are we just unlucky? Uh, I don't know how to answer her. It's also no longer practical to constantly disrupt our children's education with unnecessary quarantines and testing of asymptomatic children. It's putting additional, additional burdens on teachers to help students keep up with classwork. 
Many students are already behind from the last 18 months. It's incredibly stressful for students who at a moment's notice are refused entry to school, and it's very hard for parents to juggle a job and last minute changes to their children being home. The answer is not to bring more testings into schools as discussed in the last meeting. We need to stop testing asymptomatic children or this will simply continue to feed into the never-ending cycle of insanity. We've also been told that the way out of this is vaccines, but we also now know that they don't stop infection or transmission. They're still experimental. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has not received full FDA approval, and we've no long-term safety data for children or adults. We're teaching our children to live in a constant state of fear and that they have no autonomy over their bodies and their right to breathe freely. When we look back at these times, mandates, coercion, and censorship is not going to be on the right side of history. We need a broader conversation within our community to rationally discuss the burdens that we're putting on our children in relation to the risk of them contracting what for the vast majority of children is similar to a regular cold or flu virus. At this point, it feels like a lie to tell our children this is all for their health and safety. Finally, I would like to thank our teachers, school staff, and bus drivers, who I appreciate are doing the very best that they can in very difficult circumstances. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. <coughs> Heidi Van Voorhees. Evening. Um, I'm Heidi Van Boris. I live in Scott District in the Plains with my husband, three cats, and a new empty nest replacement dog. And can you believe how long hermit crabs can live? <laughs> they have long crabs. It's Dyslexia Awareness Month, and I'm here in my, as my role as a parent whose child went to Fauquier schools and reached Kettle Run High School unable to read yet passed SOLs until eighth grade, was not flagged by the PALS testing, and actually dropped a grade level in reading during a middle school reading specialist class. Sadly, the situation isn't rare here or anywhere. The latest national data, 67% of our eighth graders in Virginia below proficient in reading, and that figure has remained pretty static over a decade without improvement. Ten years ago, when I started researching my child's reading issues, no one at FCPS I spoke to knew what Orton-Gillingham was, what multisensory structured literacy training was, or anything about evidence-based science of reading. Yet our teachers desperately needed these critical tools and training to help our kids learn to read. Finally getting traction here, and I'm happy to report that as of now, over 241 teachers are trained and multisensory structured literacy in the next training is in the works for 2022. And there's a big thank you there for our teachers who have given their time to attend these trainings. It has been a really true team effort, um, teachers, parents, administration, community. Uh, some big thank yous due here. Dr. Nutt for her leadership in getting the Institute for Multisensory Education to Fauquier County taking a huge risk jumping before the net had even appeared. She's now making an enormous difference in some very lucky kids' lives. As an overqualified reading specialist at Marshall Middle, she's a rock star. A big thanks to Ms. Crane for taking up the effort. She's worked so hard and moved the ball much farther down the field for sure. Thanks to Fuck Your Excellence and Education for taking in and administering the privately raised funds. This part of the puzzle is much bigger than most do realize. Thanks to Dr. Jack and Mr. Warner for your support. Without it, nothing would have happened. Thank you, school board members, for your continued support. We need you now more than ever as these tools and training methods are getting operationalized into the budget. Your support for these finances is critical. We cannot waver now. So I continue my efforts with the help of State Senator Vogel to get the teachers coming to you already trained. The higher education ship seems to turn even slower than us, <laughs> but it's happening and I'm seeing the light. It's a spark. Um, I'm here to help fan the flames, bring plenty of fuel of whatever type, whatever capacity is needed, just let me know. Um, it's too late for my child, but it really is not too late for us to do better for all these kids now. So thank you all very much. Thank you. <coughs> 
jo <coughs> excuse me, Josephine Gilbert. Good evening, Chair, Board Members, Dr. Jack, and community members. My name is Josephine Gilbert, and I live in the Scott District. A barely known organization, the National Association of School Boards, writes a letter to the Biden administration on September 29th. And on October 4th, the Attorney General issues a mandate to all state and local officials to cooperate with the FBI as they investigate reports of harassment of school board members, teachers, administrators, by loud, angry parents now identified as domestic terrorists. Is the maligners under what authority? This is, this is a concocted scam by the White House and the DOJ. Five days, that includes a weekend. We notice they're undermining your authority. Excuse me. And trying to federalize education. Isn't that what McAuliffe said? In addition to the unconstitutionality, Attorney General Garland is absolutely conflicted. His son-in-law started a data mining company of children through surveys and equity curriculum. It is called Panorama Education, and it has contracts with 1,500 school systems. Close to home, Fairfax entered into a $2 million contract and used COVID money. Pretty disgusting. Do we have a contract with Panorama or another similar service provider? I'm not sure actually that we need one because what I just heard earlier is that um, the state, the Commonwealth, is mandating some surveys, some tests. And I, I think I heard both for social and emotional status, and then follow and then do the test again. Who's getting this information? Certainly, this, you know, the state has enough money, but um, I, I think parents should be very leery about what information is being collected. Um, I want to talk a, a briefly about books. I did a, a quick five-minute uh, search on this, is, and, and this is what I found. Uh, gender identity, the ultimate teen guide, explains the differences between biological sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity, and expression. Discuss intersex research and treatment, grades 7 through 12. Gene therapy explores the history of gene therapy and how this medical process works, details benefits and uses in a variety of situations. Includes photographs and timeline, grades six through nine. So you're gonna be discussing uh, benefits and variety of situations uh, of the medical process with a 12 year old, 13, 14 year old. I, I, I it just, one thing, though, is I did not see this book, which is a uh, irreversible damage, teenage girls and the transgender craze. I highly recommend it. Um, some of you have told us to contact Richmond. Let's talk about that for a minute. The Commonwealth of Virginia has been controlled by Democrats for a long time. They control the House of Delegates, the Senate, and the Governor's Office. As a matter of fact, it was McAuliffe who brought all this stuff in that we're dealing with today. Um, let's see if some of the, uh, let's look at a partial list of their accomplishments. Abortion on demand, legalized marijuana, done away with voter ID, legalized casinos for gambling, legalized sports betting, increased gasoline tax, removed monuments, gave us transgenderism, a boy who feels like a girl in the girls' locker room, no public say on books, school libraries, inappropriate material, no public say about school curriculum, School academic standards being lowered to achieve equal outcomes. School engaged in social engineering rather than education. And if the Democrats maintain control of the Commonwealth of Virginia, we will see more of the same on their list as higher taxes and do away with the right to work laws. Vote appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Watson. <clears throat> have to speak with emotion. I can't have anything prepared. It, it seems very phony to me. Um, 
I'd like to thank the teachers, staff, bus drivers, custodians. Everyone loves the teachers. We love them. I'll get that out of the way. Um, I feel it's necessary to explain to the board why most parents are defeated. To follow up with Josephine's statement about CRT, and a lot of people say it's not here, you've got to be joking. It's slowly seeping in and desensitizing our children. I see it. Also, if you're sent home with a survey or anything to opt your children out, opt it out. Write a big fat X on it and opt them out. And you have to be aware of what's going on. And I will never be shamed for caring about my children's education, ever. It's disgusting how much people are ashamed for caring about the masks, vaccinations, their education. Are you raising my child or my children? Absolutely not. I have the say in it. I'm a dang good mom. I'm not yelling at you guys. Our children are broken. They're not breaking, they're broken. And I think all my children so far have said that um, all their classmates have changed. That's my, one of my twins, the second grader. She doesn't really know what that means. She just knows that, they, that they've become meaner. And she doesn't understand. It's not adding up. They need to see smiles and they need to see faces. They have to. If this is, this is short term, our kids are fine. Long term, that's what parents are worried about. They are messed up. They will continue to be messed up. Think of them as adults. We're screwed. I don't even know why I have to remind people of that. Also, I think that a good approach would be I know you all are being told from way higher up and it's trickling down what to do. I know that. But I think it would be a good idea for our county and our everyone would be happier. You would not see destruction, anything like that, better behavior if you just treated them like people, like kids. They're, they're caged animals right now. They have something over their mouth. Would you ever put your hand over your child's mouth? What does that symbolize? Nothing. Like, just, you can't say anything. To, like, what does that mean to them? Again, thank you to the teachers, custodians, bus drivers, school board, Mr. Jack. Veronica Parr. Um, good evening. I, I come from the Central District. Um, I got a question for you and a comment. After seeing what has happened in the past few weeks in Loudoun County, which is right next door, I am terrified. Please don't let this happen to our children. A 15 year old decided that that day he wanted to wear a skirt because he felt like a woman that day. And he entered in the girl's restroom and said, and I'm not gonna say more because there's a little kid here, but he sexually assaulted a 13 year old girl. I don't have a daughter, but I've been shaking reading what happened to that family. And I'm seeing it happening to friends at Target with their five-year-old kid and a man chasing after the girl, trying to get behind, behind her in the restroom because of the law. You know, please don't let this happen to our children. This is horrible. You know, this is evil. 
the transgender community is 1% in Virginia. And, and even if it was higher, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. God created men and women. And, and we're not gonna jeopardize all these little girls. Even me, as a grown up woman, I'm afraid to go to the bathroom by myself at Target. I first go and I have to get down and make sure that there's no men in it. Because I, what, what am I gonna do when somebody's bigger than me? Girls and boys, everybody has to go to the, and everybody, you know, to the school without being afraid. And, you know, let's not pretend that this is not political be, because this is political. They are dragging our children and the government into all these. And the government, what they want is to take all of our moral values. They're, tr they're destroying everything that is good about our society. And a lot of the school board meetings, I mean, the school board's not here, but the majority are enabling that. You know, with all these books that we have seen in Texas, in Fairfax, thank God here, you know, I haven't found nothing. Well, now I know there's one. <laughs> You know, but I am terrified. I have even told my children, do not touch a book from the library. I take you to the, to the library and I buy you whatever you want, but do not touch a book. Because he came with a book named Hey Kiddo. And I have a, a pretty, you know, my children are, are very uh, innocent. You know, I try to pressure that because growing up is not, is hard. Life is hard and, and, and childhood sh should be pressure. And, and he comes with a book of, of a family saying a whole of bad words and, and, and putting heroin. And he's, well, he was terrified looking at these things, you know? So I just, I don't trust anymore what's out there. So I just wanna say, to, let's look at the mistakes that the older counties are doing and not repeat them. I mean, we have to be loving to everybody, even to whatever you feel you are or you know, me as a Hispanic, you know, we, you know, we all have to be kind to each other, but what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and Noah Sutter. You need some help with the, you got it? Good job. Hello, my name is Noah Sutter, and I am third grade at Ritchie Elementary School. And I am here today to tell you about what happened to me today at school. I have been wearing a different type of mask. I have been wearing it for over a month. But now that, but now that I wore a slightly more see-through mask, but when one of my teachers saw it, she sent me to the nurse and said I couldn't wear that type of mask and made me wear a drugstore paper mask, which made me pretty mad. I feel like I can choose what type of mask I want to wear because I can breathe a lot easier in the mask I have worn for over a month. My mom told me that there is a public health order in Virginia, but in that public health order, we didn't see any rule about what, what material your mask has to be. And when I, I got to school, when I was wearing this mask, um, it was just a slightly see-through. And I think it was only because my teacher hasn't noticed it. I, I like all my teachers at my school, but I don't like wearing masks. I would like it if they, they could change the, this mask rule so we don't have to wear a mask. Thank you for your time. That's everybody that was signed up. That's everybody, okay. Um, and is there anything else to come before the board tonight? If not, I will entertain a motion for adjournment.
Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody.